All right, thanks, Kai, and welcome, everyone. Um, this is a continuation of our series on evaluation of decision support tools and resources in which Holly Hartman has been discussing best practices for climate change decision, decision support evaluation. Um, my name is Megan Dalton. I'm the program manager for the Pacific Northwest Climate Impacts Research Consortium, or CERC. CERC is a climate science to climate action team funded by NOAA's Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessment, or RESA, program. Uh, we'd like to thank our partner, Conservation Biology Institute, for hosting this webinar series. Uh, this is the sixth webinar in this series on evaluation of decision support tools and resources. Today's webinar is about user interface testing. Holly Hartman will cover practical, low-cost methods to test how well users are able to interact with a decision support tool. Holly is the Director of Climate Science Applications for Carpe Diem West. She is a leader in research related to the development of decision support tools for climate, water, and other resource management applications. Holly joined CERC in 2015 to help us develop and improve our decision support tools and resources. So as Kai mentioned, after about 40 minutes of presentation, we'll have time for about 15 minutes of questions and discussion time. Um, so with that, I'll uh, let Holly take over. Thanks, Megan. And thanks, everybody, for showing up in the first week of the new year. It's been a few months since we had a webinar about the CERC decision support tool uh, evaluation and best practices. Uh, so it's nice to be back giving these webinars again. I, I wanted to start off with something that's pretty simple and basic uh, to get back in the swing of things. The um, Today's webinar is on user interface testing, that is, finding out whether users can actually see what your decision support tool is about and can they use it um, effectively. We'll get to that. I'm going to start off with a, a, a quick summary of sort of what is decision support, talk a little bit about my own history and how come I'm talking about this, and then uh, put this webinar in the context of our overall decision support tool assessment framework at CERC. Then I'll get into the meat of the webinar, which is about the user interface testing, about why we're going to do it, when, and how. And then I'll go over a couple of uh, next, step for, next steps for us to consider. This presentation is primarily targeted at CERC, at the team, uh, that's the teams that are developing decision support tools. But I think the material is appropriate for any group that's working on decision support tool development, especially in the area of climate and water applications. So let's just focus on what is a decision support tool, or what is decision support. I like to use the definition that was put out in the National Academy report on informing decisions in a changing climate. And it says that we're looking at not just producing and disseminating data and information, but we're also facilitating the use of that data and information in order to, to improve the quality and effectiveness of the climate-related decisions. And that's where the decision support tools come in, is to really go beyond just providing data and information, but helping people to develop their knowledge and then connect that to their uh, priorities and the wisdom that they have in managing their resources and dilemmas. So I come to this after working on a number of decision support tools, ones that I've created for different agencies and in a research setting, and advising the development of other uh, projects and coming in and sometimes rescuing decision support tool development projects that have had uh, issues in one way or another. And so what I'm going to be talking about today, this user interface testing, is just one small piece um, about developing and evaluating decision support tools. But it's a very key one because that's how we all interact with tools is through their interfaces. So within CERC, we have a couple of, we have three guiding research and development questions. This webinar and the decision support tool evaluation work fit within these. Uh, we're going to focus today on these first, the first question and the third, and that is how can decision support tools effectively help facilitate the use of data and information and knowledge development, building adaptive capacity, and then how should we evaluate them? So um, the user interface testing is a very a specific way of evaluating one part of decision support tools. And just to put this in the context of the other webinars that we've had and the frameworks that we're using in CERC, 
Um, this is the sixth webinar, and I think there was also a presentation um, to CERC early on, kind of looking at the whole overview, and we've had another uh, presentation on copyright issues and Creative Commons licenses as well. But for today, we're focusing on the user perspective, that is framework A, and that has four parts. Um, one is usability from it, um, the user's perspective, the utility and the suitability. The utility is about um, how do you choose this tool, or can you, is this tool effective? And then suitability is how do you choose this tool uh, from all the others that are out there. And then within the usability, we've already talked about the communication effectiveness and evaluating that and some of the techniques and um, thinking about language and concepts, uh, testing the formats that the products that the tool provides are uh, expressed in. Today we're focused on just testing the interface, that is how people engage with the tool. So I want to say that there's um, a class of, this is just a, a layout of the different ways that, that the user may look at a decision support tool. And so we've got usability, can we understand the tool and operate it? Suitability, uh, deciding if it's the right tool for a, a user. And then utility is saying how the tool is useful for me. How does it connect to other parts of my decision process and other tools that are out there or other tools that I use in making decisions? We're focused just on the one highlighted in red, is just the interface of a tool. And I want to say that there is a class of uh, user testing for uh, decision support tools and other software that just tests whether a tool does what it says it does. That is, if someone is using the interface, do the right actions happen? And I'm not talking about that kind of, um, of testing here today. I'm talking about testing from the perspective of a user or a decision maker, somebody engaging with the tool. Um, that is, um, can, they, can they use a tool effectively? We'll get to that in a little more detail in a minute. Um, so within CERC, we've got a number of different decision support tools or groups of tools whether it's through uh, CBI's work or the Northwest Climate Toolbox or the folks working on the Coastal Futures. And every one of these tools represents a really big investment and a commitment of time and effort for the development team. And the question is, is sort of where do design choices get made? And from many development projects that I've seen and even participated in, uh, often the design choices are left to the software developers, the coders. And while coders and software uh, developers have a lot of skills, design and, um, isn't necessarily one of them. You may have designers on your team, but um, I've often seen projects go on for months and maybe even years before the tool is actually tested with real world users. And some of the choices that software uh, developers and coders may choose can be hard to change when um, you actually connect with a user and see how they're using the tool. Um, so the idea is to make sure that we don't get stuck in a trap of being a, of having a tool that's difficult to use but then has requires a lot of recoding or refactoring to make it more usable. So the whole point of the, the user interface testing is to make sure that the decision support tool is effective, that is people can achieve the goals that they want uh, with the tool. It's to see whether their use is efficient, that is it doesn't take a lot of effort to get the results, at least relative to the results that they're after in using the tools. Some things do take a lot of effort, but it should be all, the amount of effort that it takes should be in relation to the kind of results that they get. And then the interaction with the tool should be satisfying. That is, there should be some comfort and acceptability of that, the results they get and the kind of engagement that they have with the tool. So in testing the interface of a decision support tool, there's some things that we're focusing on in particular. And that is, any parts of the decision support tool that people have expressed a concern with, that they've had some sort of issues with already that you know about, and you're just uh, trying to test which different approaches for dealing with that. Uh, you may want to test in particular some tasks that you expect to be difficult. 
That is, if you have to go through several steps to achieve an outcome with your tool. And there might be many choices in that sequence of tasks. And then within um, a development team, there might be different beliefs about your users or the way that people engage with a website or a, a tool. People might say, oh, they like the menus on the left side or a task bar at the top or um, what parts of the screen does somebody focus on and where are they putting their effort. We all come to a project with different views about what people do and prefer. Um, and like any kind of design issue, there are multiple um, implementations that may be effective. And I've seen projects come to almost a halt when a development team can't get past these uh, beliefs about what's the best approach. And so that's a good time to go out and do some testing. So when is a good time to do testing? Well, it's certainly not at the first workshop that you're using your tool or bringing your tool to a set of stakeholders or users. And it's not even a couple of months before that workshop. Um, the best time to start doing testing is right at the start with the design, whether you're using mock-ups of interfaces or even um, putting some design choices just on paper and getting responses from people. And you're sort of moving some of the pieces of paper around as if it was a computer screen. I've done those kinds of uh, assessments more with just uh, static mock-ups with groups of people uh, with specific users, and that's really effective for helping uh, lay out some of the design choices early on. And then once you're starting to develop the tool, the idea is to be able to do the testing of the interfaces um, often, that is on a regular basis or after every time you've made adjustments to your tool based on prior testing. So just a, co a continual cycle of adjusting your tool, implementing the tool, and then testing, and then just going back around and around. Um, with tools that already have been developed, you can't obviously start from the beginning, so you start where you are, and there's a couple of areas to focus on. Is if you already know that there are some problems that users are having with the uh, decision support tool, then you're, you can test different possible uh, solutions, different kinds of layouts for dealing with some of those issues. And then um, testing whether people can complete some of the complex tasks that your decision support tool might be enabling them to do. So those are good, two good places to start. Um, if I was going to add another one, I would say you'd start just with the main page and go step by step through a series of test uh, efforts to just work through all the parts of your site. But that's um, a, a bigger commitment. And I think it's easier just to start with either one of these two places. And you can make a, a, a big impact on your tool's effectiveness and ease of use. So then the question is, is how we can go through and uh, do some of this interface testing. And there's uh, a number of different ways. Uh, I've run across where folks this projects want to use expert review. And in fact, I think within CERC, sometimes that they may be, um, that's how I'm seen as, and I've been asked just to come and look at our site and give us a report on what you think about it. Um, like any design choices, people have their own preferences. And with an expert review, it's best to have more than one expert because experts do have different preferences and they have different expertise. Some can focus on maybe sort of the, the uh, Section 508 compliance or copyright issues or, um, or specific aspects of the site in terms of language and concepts that you're using. Others are gonna be looking at whether you're consistent with standards like the Section 508 whether your overall website is consistent across all of the pages and the things that it does. They'll be looking at how you prevent a user from getting stuck. That is, how do you prevent errors in the interaction with the tool? And then how you help users recognize and recover from errors that they've made. And then um, looking at how a user can see where they are within 
your tool and kind of what the status is of what they're trying to do. Are they just getting started? Are they almost done? Do they have a lot of steps yet to go, for example? Um, so you may need uh, a couple of experts that have different um, different views of a tool. So within a, a climate or water or a climate science applications kind of tool, you may want someone who is also familiar with the language, the concepts that you're trying to reinforce with your tool. Uh, is there consistency in how products are delivered and expressed and so on. There's another level of uh, evaluation that is outside evaluation services. You can go out and get um, expertise from people that do things like eye tracking. And I think Catherine with the uh, climate, um, the Northwest Climate Toolbox has uh, been involved in some efforts with um, people helping to do some of the eye tracking work. You can actually contract with Amazon and others to do evaluations of specific parts of your decision support tools. That is, they'll use um, combinations of screen, screen captures and voice recordings, and they'll go out and find the users uh, and ask them to do the specific tasks piece by piece. That can be very expensive. Um, but for some kinds of projects, say if you were doing a national level project, that would be worthwhile. But in our context within CERC, um, realistically, we don't have the resources to be doing something like that um, over and over throughout the whole design and implementation process for a decision support tool. So I'm focused on this last one, which is just a do-it-yourself do approach. The idea that it should be low enough, it should be low cost and easy so that you can do it often throughout the whole process of developing and implementing your decision support tool. I'll I want to highlight that a good place to start is with uh, the usability.gov site that goes across all of the agencies. And I think on our webinar today, we've got a lot of people from different federal agencies. And I would really point out this site as a place to start if you're thinking about uh, decision support tool testing or uh, the, the user interface testing. There are a lot of resources over there, including templates for collecting information, there's scripts that you can use for engaging with users. Um, there's, there's a lot of good stuff over there. So I'm just gonna be talking about just this, the one piece here at the, at the bottom, the do-it-yourself, the low-cost uh, do-it-yourself approach. It's designed to be just simple and quick to do so that you will do it often. The key is, is that you're testing the interface. You're not testing the concepts. You're not testing the, the say, the um, the content of the graphics. You're not testing uh, whether the person is um, connects with the science piece. You're testing whether people connect with the interface itself. So um, the population that you're testing isn't so important unless you're getting into the parts of your decision support tool that are very down deep where it is um, sort of some very specific content for very specific users. But for most of the, um, the, the web tools that you're developing, it's the, the, the people that you're using to evaluate your interface are not so important. It can be people in your family. It can be people uh, around your office. It can be students. It can be uh, a wide range of people, as long as they're familiar with the, the tool that is the, the whether you're using a desktop or a phone or a tablet, that is the technology that you're using shouldn't be, uh, the, the technology that you're using should be something that they're comfortable with. Uh, so you have to decide with what you're gonna test, not just a whole site, don't just review a whole site. You're gonna need to focus on specifically which tasks and which questions you're um, most interested in finding out. And, mentioned a couple to, to start with, the problems that you already know that you have or where you've got some um, uh, design choices that your team can't decide on, uh, can't move past, or where uh, you're looking at some complex tasks and you wanna see how folks are able to track through that. Some, there's often a thought that um, you need to get a lot of users to try to evaluate uh, an interface but this isn't a statistical sample. All you're trying to do um, 
is identify if there are barriers. So a few users is completely appropriate. It's more about testing a variety of tasks. So you won't find more problems as you check more and more and more users. You're going to get most of your results um, with just the first few users as they're trying to do those tasks. Then you can focus on fixing those issues. A lot of times they can't even get to other issues if there's something right up at the front that's causing problems. So identify those first few things that are causing problems, make adjustments for that, and then go back and do some more testing deeper and deeper within your uh, decision support tool. So you're after looking at, at the, in each one of these, choosing a variety of tasks, but not too many tasks. It takes about an hour to ask somebody to do five or 10 tasks. And the idea is that you'll be using a script so that you can control um, your engagement with them. Sometimes it's very tempting to try to help them out in doing some of their tasks, but the idea is that you need to just watch and engage with them as they're trying to use the tool um, without your help. So a script is really helpful. And then it's important to review your results right away rather than, um, it, this is another advantage of doing something that's simple and fast, is that you can get your results, look at them together as a team, and then decide how you're gonna respond to them. It's not like you have to write up a big report. It's not something that's gonna be a publishable effort. It's simply a test of to make the implementation or development of your tool more effective. So it's part of the process of tool development. Now there are two kinds of questions in thinking about the design of your uh, user testing, your interface testing. There's two, two types of questions. One is just to see whether people can even get it. Like what is, what is your site about? What is the purpose? And if it's not the overall website, it's that, it's that piece of your tool that you're testing at the time. So what is the purpose of the thing that they're looking at? What's the value proposition? That is what good would it do for them? Can they see what the organization of, the, of, of things are on the page and tell what they are? Can they see how it's supposed to work, where they're supposed to go, what are the kind of things that they could do? And then the other kind of questions that you'll be, you'll be looking at is to test key tasks. Can they do, can they actually do specific tasks? You'll be assigning them uh, things to try to accomplish with your decision support tool and tracking whether they can actually uh, go through the flow of the tool to accomplish that task. So the particular protocol, it's easy. It's, it's, um, you can do it in even 10 minutes if you have some just one task that you're wanting to check out. You can go maybe up to an hour. People get tired after much more than that. Uh, three users will tell you a lot. You don't need 10. It's not a big effort. The idea is just to highlight some of the biggest issues uh, that people can't even get past to get to the rest of the tool. And you just keep successively doing that over and over again. So in doing the specific testing, you're, you only work with one user at a time and one interviewer, and the interviewer is the note taker, or you can use something like a recording device, whether it's video, or you can do a screen capture uh, tool, use a screen capture tool or voice recording tools to track what it is that's going on. <clears throat> you do want to hold this in a focus setting where there's not going to be a lot of distractions because you do want people to be able to concentrate on your instructions and what they're trying to do. To do. You need to stick with the script. Like I said, it's easy for people to want to get off the script and try to help a user, <laughs> but you really want to see how they would use the tool in the absence of having someone right there to help them out. Um, and then um, I, I had a, qu a qu couple of question marks after this about in terms of uh, should they, will there be forms for people to fill out? Do you need to give rewards for uh, being a test subject? That depends on your setting and institution. I don't know within CERC that uh, we have to do any of that. I don't think these things fall within the, um, the human subjects kind of review because it's just it's not being used anywhere just to help to design the interface of the tool. It's not really testing what they know or what they think about um, other topics. So 
Um, and it is important to do a dry run beforehand just to work through your script, work through the tasks, just as a way to make sure that people can understand what it is that you're asking the users to do. And so you can see that it's not something that takes a lot of time if you had three users anywhere between 10 minutes to an hour. Um, that's, that's pretty manageable to be able to look at specific questions. So within the script, and the um, site usability.gov has some scripts. I can furnish uh, CERC, the CERC team with some scripts if you would want something like that, let me know. The script basically starts out just welcoming people, explaining what you're doing, uh, making it clear that you are trying to test your tool and the interface, not them. Often people can become uh, challenged in what you're asking them to do, and it's important for them to realize that it's the, the tool's issue, not their issue. Um, so you're, they're helping you test the site. You're not testing them. And you want to hear exactly what they think as they're going through the tool. So you're asking them to think out loud as they go through and respond to your questions. And so then you're just going to simply go through and ask them questions, ask them to do things. They may have questions, but you don't answer those as part of this protocol. You answer all those questions at the end because you're really trying to force the user to engage with the decision support tool and the interface rather than with you, um, other than to just tell you what they're thinking as they're trying it. Then you start off with those kind of get it questions in terms of uh, can they tell what a page does, what would they click first, what do they think this page is about, why would somebody want to be using this page, and then you'll be testing the tasks. And in asking people to do specific tasks, um, it is helpful to use scenarios to have, to have them almost do a role play as they're going through doing these tasks. It helps kind of make it clear that you're not testing them, that you're asking them to play a part in testing the tool. So you set out a scenario of, um, say, seeing an example might be to see what the variability or the, 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 the variance of um, the, the range of temperatures has been in a particular region over the last climatological period, reference period, for example. And not that you need that not you're not testing whether they know what a climatological reference period is and how to interpret the results, but how would they go through and try to do that looking at the interface? So and then once you've done gone through the few tasks that you've asked them to do, then you just wrap it up, answer their questions, thank them, and um you can give them material about your tools or your project, but it's a simple process. It's not complicated. I think that's what I—that's my point. It's really not complicated, and it's easy to think about starting off and evaluating your own tool. But a, a good—it seems. I, I guess I'd recommend that you start evaluating somebody else's tool first, just to get the hang of it and to not feel so um, constrained or. or uh, maybe I won't say defensive, but maybe uh, feel like your tool is at risk or at stake. Or the development that you've uh, done is um, is, at, is at risk or at stake when, just when you're trying to work out this evaluation process. And I just put this one up here from Australia just as a, as a particular tool, not that I say go look at and evaluate it, but just to make it clear that take uh, a tool that you might consider to be something that's doing something similar to yours or uh, whether you call it a competitor or just another option and try to do um, the user interface testing on it um, with a few users and get the feel for the kinds of information that this kind of interface testing can provide. And so that's pretty much all I have. It's not a big um, a big presentation here. I just want to ask sort of to drive home the point is, so is within CERC, is interface testing built into your development process for your decision support tool? Who is handling that? Who on the team? Is everybody in the team um, 
involved in this, and really anybody on the team can be the software developers, the designers, the 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 the, the, the scientists can all be uh, involved. And in fact, it's I think it's good at at least once for any everyone on the team to be involved in an interface testing just to see um, how people relate to the tools in your project. Um, and I do want to say that the this, the 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 simple do it yourself approach um, is is something that is manageable and don't mistake expensive that is needing a consultant or uh, uh, some sophisticated technology to do you, you don't need that to do your interface testing um, you can get a lot out of just a simple approach and it's easy to train your whole team and it does help to try on another tool first just to see how to do it and what people are looking at um, try a tool that you think is a really great tool and see if there are issues with that and so with that I'll close it up other than to say um, in you can see in the bottom line here that I do still have the team consults that I'd like to get going for this year if there's anything about the decision support tools that you guys are working on that you'd like for me to take a look at if you want to try to set something up for um, a user interface testing or any other thing that we've talked about in past webinars just let me know and I think Megan you may have a list of the past webinars the list that I saw in a an email had maybe was missing one so it would be nice to have a list of all six of these if we could send those out and then I am still working on putting out the checklists from each of the past webinars um, kind of the content so that you can um, maybe connect those webinars with your tools a little better. And so with that, I think we're open for questions, Megan. All right, thank you, Holly. That's great. And um, yes, we do have all the links and presentations for the past webinars um, on, I think it, very soon it will be on our CERC website, um, but they certainly are right now on the Conservation Biology Institute website as well. So we can make sure that everybody has the right links for all of them. So if there's any questions, go ahead and type them in either the question box or the chat box. And um, CERC team members, I have upgraded you to panelists so you can unmute yourself if you wish to um, ask a question or make a comment. Yeah, and I know Catherine's been involved in some of the user interface testing for the Northwest Climate Toolbox. And so I don't know, Catherine, if you have anything you wanna say about sort of your experience. I know you were using some sophisticated uh, technology with the eye tracking tools, I think. Hi, can you guys hear me? Hey, Catherine. Hi. Yeah. So um, this is Catherine at University of Idaho. Um, and yes, I, I did do some user testing um, through the REACH project. We didn't use eye tracking, but what we did was we used um, screen capture and um, and uh, video and, and audio recordings. And so mm -hmm. we did have users go through our go through a set of tasks and they were actually scenario tasks, just exactly as as you described, um, where they pretended they were a farmer and had a task um, that they were using the tool for a certain thing. Um, and then we recorded, we recorded their screen as they went through the web, the website um, or the web tool and did certain things um, so that we could find out like what foiled them. And we also had them uh, talk out loud so that um, we could hear their thoughts um, as they were going through it. Um, yeah, and so that, so we didn't really use such advanced technology. We really just used um, QuickTime screen capture. Mm -hmm. Yep, QuickTime screen capture to capture their their screen and the audio. And then, but um, when we did have all that video and audio to process, it actually took a long time to go through the videos and um, extract out what our action items um, for making changes and what what things went wrong. Um, so there was a lot of after analysis that happened from the user testing. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. How many how many tasks were you asking them to do then over this period? Was it over an hour's worth of? Yeah. Uh, so we actually chose to make it more like thirty minutes because we were warned that people get fatigued very quickly when being asked questions, um, and so ours were capped at. 30, we actually did 30 minutes each tasks, but we did have them do two tasks. So the, each person did do an hour. That's actually, yeah, they did do an hour. Um, and what was your other question? You just, just, um, I'm sorry. Oh, I think that took care of it. And then it just seems like that the, one of the issues is the recording of the information. Yeah, um, I'm it is. Off. Sorry about that. Um, and so the evaluation of information, and that, that is one of the risks of doing something like video or screen capture, because then you have to just go through the whole thing all over again. Oh, yeah. And it is pretty effective just if you're do, using one-on-one, -on -one, that is one interviewer, or note taker with one user yep. to just ask them to talk things through as they're working to, to answer your questions or do the tasks and just make notes. And it can be as simple as that. Yeah, and I think looking back on it, I think that um, I think that would have been more helpful. We actually had them go in a room by themselves and go through our um, our scenarios and our questions. And we did have um, quite a few people who just got stuck, and they didn't come out and ask for help. They just got stuck. So I think that if we would have been in the room, there's some things that we could have done to salvage their um, user test. So I think in retrospect, I probably would have done maybe less um but for each it, less but actually one-on-one -on -one. i think that is a, that is a good idea um yeah, yeah. And, it, and it should be easy to go through and just choose if you're looking at just a couple of tasks at a time uh, to set up something like that with three different people each of them for a half an hour uh, with somebody on your team to just have the script go through it look at the results, meet together, and then decide what to do about that specific uh, issue that you were testing. So, yeah. so do you guys plan to do more? We don't have any plans right now, although we're thinking of getting um, student volunteers from mm -hmm. climate climatology classes um, that they would get extra credit. Um, but we haven't, we don't have any plans in the near term to do that. It was kind of a really involved process. Yeah. Um, granted, maybe it was too big, um, but we had a lot of tools to get feedback on. So, and we had about five to seven um, different people on each tool. So that part I think yeah. was was useful, but it was kind of a big process and kind of draining. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that, I mean, that's one of the, that, that highlights kind of the issue of doing it in, in um, Little pieces. In little, yeah, doing it in little pieces often yeah. would seem yeah. a lot less onerous, I think. I think so, yeah. I would say that we have user test fatigue. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Just from, from our one big experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So does anybody else have any comments or questions? For some of the uh, folks with federal agencies, do you have the specific processes that you're required to follow that you know of? I think the, the academic community doesn't have quite the limitations. And I know in working on some of the projects that I've been involved with, with some of the federal agencies, as far as the user interface testing, we could do that on our own in the way that I've described this kind of this low cost DIY approach. Uh, but for a web page to be approved, it has to go through a specific process. Um, and so I just was wondering if this, any of the folks with federal agencies had run into issues with uh, the user testing. Holly, while we wait for some questions from people who aren't unmuted, this is Denise, and um, I'm working on another tool that we've used with some of our CERC um, projects, but we're in the phase right now where we want to go to our 
biggest users or the ones who use the tool most often and ask them where the problems are. And do you think that's an okay approach rather than doing this um, if, design if, that you had? Because these are people who are really comfortable using the tool for what they, they want to use it for. Right. There's two different things that you're trying to test. One is just the basic interface. Right. And for that, it doesn't have to be the user. Right. Get the, get the bugs worked out of the basic interface. And that's a different effort than, say, working out the bugs of the functionality that it does. Okay, and, so we're probably the products you're delivering. Right. So they're, they're two different issues. Mm -hmm. And the user is the one that is certainly, as we talked about in, I think, the second webinar on design principles or priorities, uh, strategies, and tactics, the sophisticated users are the ones that help drive your. Um, functionality and then the simple users or the, the beginning users are the ones that help you design your interface about how you do things. <laughs> okay, thanks. That helps clarify what we need to do with this user. Mm -hmm. Holly, we had a, um, an answer to your question from Dave Esslinger at NOAA. He says, I think we at NOAA are similar. Web pages go through testing, um, but decision support tools we can test on our own. So that's good because I know for some for web pages it can be uh, a difficult process. <laughs> I know and Dave, the, the I've, climate. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Dave. I've unmuted you. If you have um, more you'd like to say about that, or you can mute yourself. Anybody else? I think I see Gabrielle on as a panelist. Maybe she has a question or a comment. Yeah, I think she does. She, I think, had to call back in for some reason. Um, she says in the chat that the USDA requires approval for websites, but there is not comprehensive guidance for decision support tools. She also says, we, we are working with collaborators on improving how we evaluate tools and at what stage. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that, that, that overall evaluation, I think we've got a lot of other um, approaches in the different webinars and I'll be talking, I've got two more webinars coming up. I guess I should end up with that. Is it uh, the next webinar coming up it has to do with uh, the, the third framework that is looking at things like metrics, and attributes and looking at your process components of um, how, how you fit decision support tools within this process of facilitating the, um, the translation and transfer and use of uh, data and information for making climate relevant uh, decisions. So um, there are a number of different ways that we've talked about in evaluating decision support tools, but uh, today just focusing on that interface testing and the whole point is is it it's there are simple ways to do it and if you do it piece by piece by piece in um, putting together your tool um, it can have big payoffs rather than waiting until the very end and considering that part of the overall evaluation so Holly there was one more comment um, uh, from Dave Esslinger that the web, web pages have the um, 504 compliance issue, which I don't know anything about, but you might. Oh yeah, the 508, fi uh, Section 508 compliance, that's for the Americans with Disabilities Act. So that's so that people can use your tool that is with, that are maybe sight impaired or have other kinds of impairments. And it has something, it, 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 there are some specific guidelines for how to deal with color palettes, the size of font, types of fonts, types of layouts. Um, a lot. Can you use voice readers to read the web page rather than um, 
rather than having to have someone read it. So it's there's some issues for our applications when it comes to using things like maps that are really challenging and some of the dynamic interaction. But that's a whole specialty unto itself. And that's where if you're doing an expert review, like I mentioned in one of the early slides today, that's the kind of expert review that's worth having um, is that Section 508 compliance. And the sooner be the better <laughs> uh, for some things. So if there are, Let's see, are there any other questions from Go ahead. Sorry, Holly, I was I was I was jumping to the same thing you were um, asking <laughs> any final questions anybody else on the line might have. Well, see no questions. Um, I guess we can end a little early. Holly, did you have any last words you'd like to share? No, other than um, to say if anybody has any questions, you can always get a hold of me by email. Um, and I'm happy to talk with you about your decision support tools and try to do some uh, user interface testing. It's not a hard thing to do, it's, but it, I think it's an important thing to do throughout your whole process. And it can make the, uh, your, your tools ultimately more useful uh, down the line and a lot um, <laughs> rather than getting stuck somewhere with, uh, with a problem that takes a lot of coding or a whole redesign to deal with. Um, and then our next webinars are, uh, was it February 1st and March 1st, that deal with this academic research perspective in evaluating decision support tools. So I hope to see some folks there as well. All right, thank you, Holly, and thanks everyone for joining, and we look forward to um, hearing more from Holly um, on the next webinar. All right. Happy New Year. All right. Thanks, everyone.